So in the second part, we're going to talk about memory recovery techniques. So one of the things that was happening when Loftus was doing some of these studies, uh, looking at false memory creation in the laboratory, uh, remember repeated imaginings or reminiscings can cause false memories, but what was happening is some therapists were using hypnosis to uncover uh, hidden memories. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about this, like what do they, what do, they do? In fact, um, remember... Um, the connection here is that uh, Loftus in her laboratory was showing, showing repeated imaginings led to false memories, but this is happening in hypnosis. The suggestions are directed by the therapist, right? And several experimental studies checked into this and found that, like, basically, if you couldn't remember information, you couldn't remember it uh, when you were under hypnosis. But there were Many people in many case reports that sort of believe that hypnosis unlocked sort of hidden memories. Remember the Lacey and Stark, and I have the image there, the Lacey and Stark uh, paper showing that the public mostly agreed that it could hypnosis can uncover uh, memories. So the question remains, like, what does hypnosis do to memory? And to, in order to investigate this, Sheehan and Tilden, what they did is they had subjects watch a 24-slide sequence depicting someone getting their wallet stolen. Half were hypnotized and then questioned about their the event, and of course the other half were not. And so they were able to do this, look at it in a controlled situation. So here's their data. They first looked at accuracy, and slide will clear up here, first looked at accuracy, and as you can see, the hypno, hip, hypnotized subjects, so ignore suggestibility, it didn't really have any effect there, but basically you can, if you're, um, if you're high in imagery, you're much more likely to be hypnotized. So that's a suggest suggestibility factor here, but there's no difference there. So if you looked at the hypnotized group versus the control group, the control group actually remembered more information that they of the slide sequence, right? But if you look at confidence, so this is the percent that said that they were certain, the hypnotized group was actually much more confident than the control group. So if hypnosis does anything it doesn't help accuracy there's no evidence that it helps accuracy or unlock hidden memories but it might make people more certain of their memories now this um, disconnect between accuracy and their confidence and it might surprise you but actually it doesn't surprise us at all remember the meta memory concepts right a lot of times we're not in touch with our own memories and this is a case where people are sort of overconfident about their memories. That happens quite a lot. Often that's why we collect accuracy and confidence ratings at the same time. So uh, these memory recovery techniques uh, don't seem to really work. In fact, they could lead to other distortions like false memories. So that has some implications for eyewitness memory. This is a place where our memories actually have a real applied sort of setting. And so the first question I have for you is, do people trust eyewitness memory? And uh, Kevin and Milne uh, surveyed police officers. 74% of police officers believe the eyewitnesses were rarely incorrect. And this doesn't, hasn't seemed to change very much, right? Because remember the Lacey and Stark question about one confident eyewitness. A lot of people think that was a good enough to convict somebody. Uh, so that tells you that eyewitnesses are still given a lot of credence. So do people trust eyewitness memory? So uh, a little bit of evidence from that Lacey and Stark thing, but Loftus uh, did a study where she had subjects read an account of a robbery murder, and then uh, it only contained you know, circumstantial evidence linking, linking the uh, suspect to the crime. So when you had no eyewitness, uh, so there was no eyewitness in the narrative people were only willing to convict at 18%. So that shows you the evidence is really pretty weak. When you add an eyewitness, that jumps up to 72%. Now, the important thing is they also were given information that the eyewitness had really poor eyesight. But you can see that that didn't really temper their uh, reliance on this eyewitness information at all. It only went down just a very little bit. So people use this information or they rely or, or believe that there's a credibility to this to eyewitnesses information. So uh, another question that's sort of related to this, uh, Loftus and Palmer did a study where they uh, had subjects watch a video of a car accident and then they changed the way in which they asked questions about the car accident. 
So uh, they were simply asked, how fast was the car going when it blanked into the other car? And they were, so they were estimating speed of the cars in this videotape. So when they used the word contacted, they were estimated 31% and so on. And you can see that as the verb gets a little more violent, the speed estimates go up, right? So what this tells you is just the phrasing of the question can alter people's, in this case, estimates of speed or memory about the accident. So the question itself can, can do that. Now, the other thing that was really interested about this particular study is they brought people back like one week later and they asked them, did you see broken glass? Now, as you might imagine, broken glass fits with your schema for a car accident. And the group that was in the smashed condition, much more likely to report that they saw broken glass. Uh, the reality was there was no broken glass. So they were reporting false memories there. In another study that she did, which is called the Red Dotson study, she had people watch sort of a slide sequence of a car accident. Half of the participants saw a stop sign, half saw a yield sign, and then later they were asked, did the, another car pass the red dots and at the stop or yield sign? And they were able to either match it or mismatch it depending on what condition they were in. And of course they did that with half, uh, half of the groups. And um, of course, what they did later is 20 minutes later, they were asked to pick the correct slide. The consistent group was 75% accurate. The inconsistent group was only 41% accurate. So in other words, seeing this uh, altered photo changed your memory of whether it was a stop or a yield sign, which in this case was a key piece of evidence in this car accident. Uh, Loftus also had a study where she sort of asked, looked at the way the question was framed, right? So people were asked, do you occasionally have headaches? They only estimated uh, less than one per week. Do you frequently have headaches? and it went up, right? So how you frame the questions can alter and distort your memory. So that's another piece of information to keep in mind is just the way the question is asked and think about an eyewitness, how many times they've been asked about whatever it is that they've witnessed by lawyers, by other witnesses. Each time this can sort of distort or alter your uh, interpretations of it. Also, if you're headed to a medical career, it sort of gives you an idea of how you should be asking neutral kinds of questions and not loading the question to get a response that you want. So this, all of this information, while it's really important and uh, shocking, it also plays a role in children. What about children's eyewitness memory? So we're going to pick this up in the next part. We'll talk about uh, how question, questions in children's memory is affected.